Thank you. There are uh, a lot of good reasons for thinking that ketogenic diets are going to be valuable for treating or preventing cancer. Uh, unfortunately, we have very little data that uh, will support those ideas. And um, so what I'm going to present to you is, is kind of uh, energy metabolism 101, which outlines what we're thinking about and where we think we could attack cancer. And uh, I'll present a little bit of the uh, approach in my lab. Uh, unfortunately, in the end, I think that uh, ketogenic diets for cancer is somewhat uh, like what somebody said about military intelligence. It's more what we aspire to than what we have. So uh, the uh, work I describe is, is uh, the principal investigator is uh, Dr. Eugene Fine, who's at Einstein, and I'm at uh, Downstate Medical Center associated with nutrition and metabolism. I, I left off the Pennzoil sticker. Uh, the, uh, but the real sponsors for this are some of the people in the audience. And uh, because uh, the work I'm describing was funded directly or indirectly by crowdsourcing on experiment.com. So we're very grateful to a lot of people who donated and who brought to the attention a uh, uh, a donor who wants to remain anonymous but is supporting our work. So this is uh, Gene's work. And uh, in uh, looking at ketogenic diets specifically, the focus in a lot of cancer research is uh, in the direction of uh, metabolism rather for, uh, So, uh, rather than focusing on uh, genomic or uh, control of uh, expression. And so we're really going to ask, what's wrong with uh, metabolism in cancer cells, which involves, again, I'll outline what is normal metabolism. And the Warburg effect is a major principle. And I'm going to tell you some of the terms that are used in particular Aerobic glycolysis seems like a contradiction in terms since glycolysis is always anaerobic, that is, doesn't use oxygen. Uh, so what the term means is simply that cancer cells tend to use, uh, run glycolysis even if they uh, have enough oxygen not to. So that's what the term is. So uh, basically I'm going to uh, maybe uh, call this uh, Varberg 101. Now, the uh, general soundbite on the Varberg effect is that uh, cancer cells use glycolysis in place, of anaerobic, in place of aerobic metabolism. That's not quite right. Varberg himself recognized early on, if you want to kill cancer, it's not enough to uh, deprive it of glucose. You have to knock out oxygen as well. You have to. Uh, so. Let me give you uh, some background first, and then I'll run through uh, metabolism as we see it. So this is uh, uh, Gene Fine's uh, 2012 study, and he had uh, 10 p advanced cancer patients. You had to have failed or refused chemotherapy to get into the study, and it was a, a safety and feasibility study, and, and the patients did okay. In addition, several of the patients had uh, showed stable disease the di uh, or uh, a partial remission, and those are the people who had the highest ketone bodies. Uh, and uh, uh, you can see the uh, blue uh, had higher levels of ketone, and this was not due to uh, uh, differences in e either how much calories they took in or, or how much weight they gained or lost. The, the goal was, of course, in a, a cancer study to encourage the patients to stay at a constant weight. But they did actually lose weight, uh, uh, which has always been, to me, one of the arguments for a low-carb diet is 
common when you try to maintain weight, uh, it's hard to do that. And uh, what was found is that the insulin and ketone bodies moved in the opposite direction. So the, the patients with the highest ketone bodies had the lowest insulin. Now, we don't want to make too much of this. This is a ver very small study. And uh, there's only 10 patients and uh, uh, 30 days. Uh, but we do want to look at the cellular uh, effects. And we uh, took a number of different cancer lines uh, grown in, in culture and treated them with acetoacetate. Acetoacetate is, uh, I put uh, down at the bottom some terms that I either didn't define or you may not be familiar with. Uh, we had uh, two uh, breast cancer lines and five uh, colon cancer lines, and we treated them with acetoacetate, which is one of the ketone bodies. Uh, the more common uh, beta-hydroxybutyrate was not as effective as what I'm going to show you, uh, and this has been observed in other places, and the defect may be in the interconversion of the two ketone bodies. Uh, in any case, what we found is that both ATP, the levels of ATP in these cells, uh, in the cancer lines was uh, reduced, and this correlated uh, closely with uh, uh, closely with uh, the amount of uh, cell growth. So the, the cells were inhibiting growth in lower ATP. The uh, controls were normal fibroblasts, and those are on the, the left side of the dotted line. Uh, and uh, you can see that the red and blue bars correlate well, and uh, even in the published paper, we somehow neglected to say which is which, but uh, maybe that makes our point. Uh, in any case, the uh, levels of protein were uh, constant for the uh, different effects of ATP. So this is not a general, we weren't killing the cells. This is not a general uh, uh, disturbance. The cancer cells overexpressed uncoupling protein too. Now, uh, this is, uh, to be precise, this is a marker that's common to uh, uh, cancer cells. The background is that uncoupling means separating uh, active metabolism from actual ATP generation. In other words, you're running metabolism, but you're not getting any uh, usable energy out of it. And uncoupling protein 1 is the naturally, a naturally occurring uncoupling protein. And it, uh, well, it, what I mean is it uncouples cells. Uncoupling protein 2 ha has a very close homology with uncoupling protein 1, and uh, we're not sure whether or to what extent it's a real uncoupler. It may do something else. It may be a, a transport protein. So I'm, uh, the uh, you know, bottom line on that is just when you thought it was safe to go and look at uncoupling. Uh, the, uh, but the uncoupling protein 2 and ATP uh, are correlated as, uh, inversely, and uh, so it's not excluded that there's a direct effect in cutting off the expression of energy uh, in, in a usable form as ATP. It is uh, well known, of course, that cancers are glucose avid, and that, that's uh, a hallmark. Related to that, people often say that uh, uh, you can starve the, uh, starve the cancer for glucose by not administering carbohydrate, but that, of course, does not work, partly because uh, blood glucose is regulated. Uh, dietary glucose will not necessarily lower it. And in addition, the cancer cells overexpress uh, a, uh, what's called GLUT1, which is a a protein that picks up glucose with high affinity. And you, there is a particular marker for this. The uh, agent called cytochalasin B uh, does knock out the, uh, uh, I'm going to see if I, do I have a pointer here? 
Well, you can see that. Uh, it's the red. Oh, okay. Yeah. This. Uh, right here. This one. This button. Oh, okay. So you can see that the cytochrome V will knock out uh, half of the uh, uh, glucose uh, cytochromes in the blood, and in the cancer cells, the uh, treatment with acetoacetate is almost as good, but it does not have uh, the same effect in the uh, uh, normal fibroblasts. So. Uh, the question is, what goes on in energy metabolism? What is uh, the function of the ketone bodies uh, in controlling it? And uh, finally, uh, we want to ask, how can we get at this experimentally? You know, I'm going to show, what I'm going to show you is uh, an outline of uh, metabolism, and uh, we're going to ask, how we, could we uh, break into this outline and figure out which parts are really relevant? Now, ATP, you know, is considered a high-energy compound. It's really, it's really that it takes place in a high-energy uh, reaction that is, it can be broken down and is used to run an, uh, <clears throat> uh, metabolic reactions that require energy. So I'm going to take the black box approach. Now, in the black box approach or systems approach, what we do is we, if we don't know what the underlying mechanism is we look at the inputs and look at the outputs and try to deduce what's going on. It's a uh, uh, approach that's favored by engineers who are the uh, people who are most unhappy if they think they don't know anything at all. So uh, <laughs> we pretty much know what the black box of life is. You put in food. I'm going to emphasize for a start, glucose, you put in oxygen, you get CO2 and water. And somehow this uh, allows you to generate the high energy uh, ATP. So what you usually do is we can deduce here that we're looking at oxidation reduction reactions, uh, which would bring you back to general chemistry. The specific thing that I think is important that uh, I won't emphasize too much is that uh, oxidative metabolism can generate unwanted uh, or uh, possibly wanted very reactive oxygen species. So, uh, uh, and those are usually just indicated simply as ROS uh, or reactive oxygen species because they're a little hard to define in what their uh, mechanism is. So let's look inside the box. The first thing we look at is the process known as glycolysis. The, the name tells you what it does. Lysis means breaking, and it breaks down uh, glucose, uh, and somehow that makes, uh, gives us a certain amount of uh, ATP. Uh, the, uh, this is an important note that la uh, acid names for carboxylic acids and the uh, uh, salt name are used interchangeably. So. Uh, Glycolysis breaks glucose down. Glucose is a six-carbon compound. It usually folds up into a hexagonal uh, structure. And uh, the effect of glycolysis is to generate two three-carbon compounds. So it splits uh, uh, glucose into these two three-carbon compounds. The uh, uh, name pyruvate uh, also may tell you something. Pyre, of course, is the same root as fire, as in pyromaniac. And Uvo in Romance languages uh, refers to grapes. The uh, uvula is the grape-shaped thing in the back of your throat. So this uh, glycolysis is about firing grapes, in other words, fermentation. So this is the process by which uh, 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 fermenting bacteria carry out metabolism. Uh, alcoholic bacteria will convert pyruvate to ethanol, and uh, uh, the uh, bacteria that make your yogurt will con convert it to uh, lactic acid. And we'll see, uh, you probably know that humans can do that too. So this is the major fate of pyruvic acid in uh, cells. 
is that they are further oxidized to carbon dioxide and uh, ac acetyl-CoA. Uh, Acetyl-CoA is a derivative of acetic acid, which you may remember from uh, freshman chemistry, and is the substrate for the TCA cycle. TCA stands for tricarboxylic acid cycle, or also called citric acid cycle, uh, or the Krebs cycle. Well, Krebs called it the TCA cycle, and uh, uh, that's what uh, uh, we'll use. The effect of the TCA cycle, if you've studied it, you uh, remember the uh, uh, horrendous collection of uh, transformations that you had to uh, learn. But the net effect is that uh, the Krebs cycle converts acetyl oxidized acetyl-CoA to CO2, and uh, uh, all those things in the uh, TCA cycle are really carriers more than intermediates. In any case, the oxidizing agent is a compound called NAD, and its product is called NADH, and it goes into the, the third of the inner black boxes, and where it gets uh, uh, reoxidized back to NAD. The, the, this is the, the oxidation in the electron transport chain is uh, controlled by molecular oxygen. So this is where oxygen actually enters into the black box of life. And this is where you get most of the ATP. You can get almost 10 times as much as you can get from glycolysis. This uh, is the key slide in that it separates uh, the way in which energy is obtained aerobically, that is with oxygen, and uh, or anaerobically uh, with pyruvate, which under those conditions is converted to lactic acid or lactate. Uh, so this is the uh, this is the starting point, and what the Warburg effect is really about is somehow crossing that line didn't go right. That uh, we're getting uh, too much lactic acid, uh, not enough uh, carbon dioxide. So, uh, but it's worth looking at this for a minute and recognizing that uh, we still have the same black box of life. You put in glucose and you, and you put in oxygen, you get out CO2 and water. They're separated and the oxygen never sees the food. So it's important to uh, recognize that. Now what Warburg measured was lactate and CO2. And he uh, did tissue culture had cancer uh, tissues and showed that they generated a har uh, far greater level of lactate, uh, lactate compared to CO2 than normal tissues. And uh, uh, this was uh, pursued by the Cori's. You may be familiar with the Cori cycle, which explains how the liver and uh, muscles can uh, cooperate to uh, run anaerobic glycolysis uh, for its speed in rapid exercising. Uh, Gertie Corey was the uh, first American woman to win the Nobel Prize, although she was born in Czechoslovakia. Uh, and this is the uh, uh, commemorative stamp. Uh, it actually had a misprint. The, uh, the structure was not right. This is a corrected version. Uh, if you have the original stamp, you uh, uh, should hold on to it, and it uh, could be worth thousands like the Mozambique purple. Uh, what she did is had, she had a chicken with a, a, a cancer in the forelimb, and she uh, uh, intubated it that she stuck a, a tube into the cancer forelimb and also into the one that was normal, and she compared the... Uh, blood uh, from those two uh, uh, from those two points in the chicken, and what she found is that it, when she measured the lactic acid, it was uh, in the two uh, veins. It was uh, lactic acid was always favored in the tumor vein, whereas CO2 was always favored in the uh, 
uh, in the normal vein, and this constitutes a, a demonstration in vivo of the Warburg effect. So this is, again, our working uh, vision of the black boxes. One more thing, though, is uh, there's another component of uh, one of the components of the electron transport chain is the, uh, the particle known as the ATP synthase, which, as the name says, it, that's the particle that actually ma makes ATP. It's driven by a high energy state that involves the membrane of the mitochondrion. So I didn't say this, but you probably know that uh, that dotted line was really separating the glycolysis in the what's called the cytosol of the cell from the mitochondrial effects. So uh, the ATP synthase is the place where the uh, high energy state, it's actually transport of hydrogen ions across the membrane. Uh, that high energy state is dissipated and uh, returns to normal. And that the energy in uh, returning the state, the membrane to a uh, stable state is what drives ATP synthesis. So here's a uh, uh, biological version of the black box. Uh, you, what it emphasized, of course, is oxygen coming in, but rather than lactate going out, uh, H plus, lact uh, lactate is, uh, lactic acid is an acid, and so you can measure the acid effect. Uh, Warburg, well, the original effect of the Warburg effect was to think that the mitochondria uh, is damaged, but that's generally not true. So something's wrong, and the question is, where is the problem? Well, it could be in the uptake of glucose. We know that uh, we can inhibit that with uh, ketone bodies. It could be in uh, pyruvate, and I'll uh, emphasize uh, uh, in another slide that um, uh, that's the big uh, step from pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. That's where metabolism is regulated substantially. And it could be an electron transport. So uh, these are just obvious questions. Basically, we want to know what's going on. So uh, I've separated black boxes into uh, two tissues. And in the liver, acetyl-CoA is the uh, substrate for the TCA cycle, but it's also where the ketone bodies are made and transported. And uh, the net effect is, the, uh, to understand what ketone bodies do, is they carry acetyl-CoA to the tissue. So if we think that we have uh, two kinds of energy substrates, we have glucose and we have acetyl-CoA, the liver uh, uh, transports the acetyl-CoA in the form of this dimer either beta-hydroxybutyrate or say acetate, uh, and then uh, the tissues will carry this back to acetic acid, and the energy will be used for the TCA cycle. And this is consistent with uh, the general view that the liver is the kind of command center for metabolism, and the tissues are consumers. You can't go back to uh, pyruvate. And uh, if you want glucose from pyruvate, you have to put in something else, which is proteins. But let's uh, focus just on the uh, acetyl-CoA. And uh, pyruvate dehydrogenase is the enzyme that converts uh, pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. And it is the big control center. It's the big traffic cop. And the main thing is that it has extensive feedback inhibition. So uh, just as a, uh, maybe a digression, it's simply that if you have a lot of energy coming from fat, for example, if you're on a ketogenic diet, uh, PDH will see that you don't waste any pyruvate uh, in, in running energy uh, and, and shuts down the conversion. The pyruvate, of course, will be used for uh, uh, gluconeogenesis. So uh, 
the uh, crowdsourcing allowed us to buy this uh, instrument. This is Anna Miller, who does most of the work in the lab. And uh, what she's holding is a uh, micro carrier, uh, sort of tissue culture uh, sampler that is very small. And basically what uh, that is is a Barberg meter. And so the uh, device, uh, The device will carry out Warburg experiments uh, with high throughput. Okay, so how, how, where is it, where's the problem here? How are we going to find this out? And the, what you do in the, uh, it's called a, sea, a seahorse analyzer. Uh, nobody in the company could tell me why it's called seahorse, but that's what it's called. Uh, and what it does is it, it can administer inhibitors. So one way at, at getting at a complex uh, system uh, like this is to inhibit each of the steps and see what happens. So I'm going to show you the inhibitors. Uh, we're drifting into a sort of complicated metabolism, but bear with me. So this, one of the simplest inhibitors is a uh, ATP synthase inhibitor called oligomycin. Uh, the ATP synthase is called F1FO. Uh, FO stands for oligo. Uh, the F1 is, is simply historical. It's the first thing that, the first fraction that came off the mitochondrion when they sonicated it. Uh, so uh, we, uh, oligomycin is very useful. Of course, it will shut down the whole business. If you can't make ATP, you're not going to generate a high energy state. If you can't make a high energy state, you're not going to run the Krebs cycle, so everything's going to stop. We can also put in a a variant of glucose, uh, 2-deoxyglucose, and that'll stop glycolysis cold because there's no substrate. That's obvious enough. And I, I won't emphasize this, but there are a whole bunch of uh, different inhibitors that will target the members of the electron transport chain. If you're a gardener, you probably know rotenone is an uh, insecticide. The important one, though, is the uncoupler. And the one that's used is FCCP. And uh, what it does is it breaks the high energy state. So what happens is that it's now, uh, whatever you do, is whatever energy you generate, you're not going to be able to use it to make ATP. So there's no ATP. But electron transport can continue to run. In fact, it runs better because it's not uh, locked into uh, further metabolism. So uh, the uh, seahorse goes through a, a bunch of these, and we try to make a deduction from that. Uh, to explain the inhibitors to medical students, I usually use this slide, uh, the uh, car analogy. And uh, the, in the car analogy, the engine run, takes in oxygen and takes in fuel and uh, generates energy in terms of the movement of the drive shaft of the uh, uh, crankshaft, which is uh, coupled through the clutch uh, to the uh, drivetrain, which then turns the wheels, which by analogy is the synthesis of ATP. So this is how you use the engine to uh, uh, move the car. Now, if you put a block under the wheels, that's like putting oligomycin into the uh, mitochondrion. The wheels stop, uh, the uh, drivetrain stops, the engine stops because it's stalled, it can't run. So everything shuts down with oligomycin. On the other hand, if you put in an uncoupler like FCCP, that's like putting the car in neutral. Because what happens now is you can race the engine, but you're not going anyplace because uh, uh, the clutch plate is separated. I point out that in uh, German and probably several other languages, uh, Kupplung is the word for clutch, and so the, uh, the, uh, the clutch is the uh, coupling. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, what we're going to do now is let the seahorse run these inhibitors and see what it looks like. Okay, this is the slide for my uh, the next hour of the talk, uh, which uh, uh, I think has to be next year. I'll just t briefly tell you what happens. What you're looking at there is what uh, 
uh, lactate and oxygen uptake, the open circles are the cancer. It, it is distinctly different in the seahorse from normal cells. The filled cells are when we added uh, uh, acetoacetate in advance. And uh, I'll just get you the last summary slide. And uh, I'll tell you the, the bottom line is that what this is showing is that acetoacetate is inhibiting both the oxidative part and the glycolytic part. And it's the, uh, the ketone-treated tr part uh, is substantially uncoupled. And the cancer cell uh, is uh, similarly uh, relatively un uncoupled. And I'm going to have to ask you to wait till next year for the rest. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Uh, uh, questions at the microphone, please. Hi. What is your opinion to use a cetogenic diet and a hyper hyperbaric oxygen to treat cancer? Well. We have limited data, but uh, you know, uh, of course, uh, uh, Dom D'Agostino has done you know very impressive work showing that the combination of hyperbaric oxygen and the ketogenic diet will be valuable. Uh, we only have first principle. I don't think we know what will happen. Uh, you know, it's. Um, I'm afraid that my opinion on a lot of these ideas, which are very good, is uh, if you look at the big picture, the glass is uh, more than half full, but we don't know the answer. And, and there is the problem, of course, that, w that oxygen will increase the oxidative component of the metabolism. But what I didn't show you is that part of the uh, running the uh, electron transport chain involves the generation of the reactive oxygen species. Now, what is that doing? Well, we don't know what it's doing because these are very highly reactive compounds. They may be uh, deleterious to the cell, but on the other hand, they may be scavenging uncoupling protein too. So uh, we don't know that the, uh, the we don't know that uncoupling protein two is harmful. We don't know that reactive oxygen species. Uh, aren't a uh, component whereby cancer cells uh, uh, keeps itself alive by not letting uh, uncoupling protein two get out of out of hand. I know that's an unsatisfying answer, but uh, we have to recognize that uh, these both of those are reactive uh, agents that we don't know about. Thank you. Thank you. That was terrific. I, my question is, after this discovery of the DNA, obviously the Warburg effect kind of took a back seat in a lot of the cancer studies. And it was Pete Peterson who kind of picked up, I think in the 70s, and did some studies with the mitochondria and how the impact of cancer and the, the functioning of the mitochondria and concluded that there was a defect within the mitochondria, but you just said that there really was no correlation between the functioning of the mitochondria and cancer. I'm just curious as to, as to how Pete Peterson's work dovetails no, uh, with your own work. Yeah, what, what I said is that uh, there was the notion that they were uh, uh, damaged possibly physically, but the mitochondria are frequently intact. There are cancers uh, where clearly uh, th there's something wrong with the mitochondria, but functionally there's clearly something wrong. Right. Uh, yeah, th these are not normal functioning. Uh, mitochondrion as far as we can see. Okay. So okay, that's, that's yeah, but, but it's not like the uh, the mitochondrion fell apart. Right. Okay. Thanks. Hello. On your slide that's up right now in that section two, um, is are you showing that the combination of the uncoupler and the ketones are are more powerful than one or the other. What happens if you just add ketones and don't have that uncoupler? Well, that's what you have here. The, the uh, uncoupler is injected uh, into that little green uh, tube. So here you, uh, Say that the oxygen 
in this experiment, I don't want to generalize because we're uh, this kind of thing. Well, you can see there's some variation. You have to do. Oh. Uh, you can see what this is, is the basal uptake of oxygen. It's much greater in the cancer cell than the cancer cell that's been treated with acetoacetate. Similarly, there's a, a reduction in the uh, uh, lactate part, that is the glycolytic part. So th the inhibition that we saw in the gross sense has two components. As to which is, uh, well, to me, the, the, major, the major piece that's surprising here is when you, uh, what a, a cancer cell does, and this is a, one variation on the Warburg effect, is when, at this point, we put in, uh, oh, shoot. we put in oligo. So that is, uh, you know, that's the block under the wheels of glycolysis. The cancer cell compensates uh, tremendously in uh, running glycolysis now to make up ATP. So if, if we had an ATP uh, curve here, you would see that it doesn't change at all. Uh, and, uh, but but uh, as far as we can see, acetoacetate is knocking that out. Okay, I'm, but I, uh, this is not the take-home message. Uh, what I'm showing you is the method we have to do a lot of uh, experiments uh, from various angles to be sure of that. Or as St. George said, uh, today we celebrate, tomorrow we do the controls. So, uh, <laughs>